Good morning, everyone. It's Sunday the twin. No, <laughs> it's Sunday the thirteenth of December. I, I won't go back and edit that out. I'm just symptomatic of all of our lives at the moment. Not even sure what week it is, but it's the third Sunday of Advent. And I'll offer you a few thoughts on two of today's readings: a passage from John's Gospel, and then the passage from Isaiah. So we'll pick up in the beginning of John's Gospel. Um, after I said a few words about the Christmas adverts. I don't know about you, but I've really enjoyed the Christmas adverts on TV this year. They've seemed to be less hectic, less, much less about buying all the stuff that's just right and cooking it just perfectly and having loads of people around a hugely bulging, groaning table full of things and next to a tree loaded with presents underneath it. It's been much more about relationship and about some simple, simpler things. Um, I've enjoyed the Tesco ad particularly, which was all about the fact of the year we've had and just saying, you know what, everyone deserves Christmas, don't they? Whatever they've been like and whatever this year's been, I found that great. I also think um, that praise must go to Lidl for their, their Christmas advert, which um, has, I think as its best moment, somewhat spearing Aldi's Kevin the Carrot out of a tray of glazed roasted carrots with Kevin the Carrot with a big frowny face upon his uh, upon his little carrot face. I don't know. But I've enjoyed I've enjoyed the way that they've all sort of taken a step back from this seem to her, from this massive consumer driven, overblown, overabundant Christmas that we normally are are sold or they try to sell to us. Back to John's Gospel. John chapter, let me find it, I've hidden it away. John chapter um, chapter 1, and we read just a couple of verses introducing John the Baptist, because today we focus on his life. But I want to pick up from verse 19. So this is, this is the answer he gives to those who come to question him from the religious authorities. This is the testimony given by John when the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, Who are you? He confessed and did not deny it, but confessed, I am not the Messiah. And they asked him, well, What then? Are you Elijah? He said, I am not. Are you the prophet? He answered, No. Then they said to him, Who are you? Let us have an answer for those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? He said, I am the voice of one crying out in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, as the prophet Isaiah said. Now they'd been sent from the Pharisees. They asked him, Why then are you baptizing, if you are not neither the Messiah, nor Elijah, nor the prophet? John answered, I baptize with water. Among you stands one who you do not know, the one who is coming after me. I am not worthy to untie the thong of his sandal. This took place in Bethany, across the Jordan, where John was baptizing. Powerful words and lots of lots of things to chew over in the little bit we have. John's gospel has the most about John the Baptist, especially that part where he replies to those who come to question who he is. And it does seem that in the early days of the Christian church, there was there were the beginnings. There there was well, certainly around the time there were still questions about about who was greater, John or Jesus and the disciples. Some of those followers of John the Baptist, even though he was also long dead somehow thought that he was greater than Jesus. So we think some of the writing in John's Gospel and other places downplays John the Baptist deliberately to big up the person of Jesus. But maybe there's more to it than that, or we could just read more into it. We can play with the story for the sake of thinking about ourselves and our lives. We can imagine John the Baptist in the desert and some of his perhaps inner life as he goes through that time. He quotes from Isaiah, prepare the way of the Lord. And all the Christmas ads and everything about this season are always saying to us, are you ready? Are you ready? Are you ready? And uh, and there's maybe this, this year less than previous years, but there isn't this kind of frantic rush to have a particular kind of Christmas in our imaginations or in our delivery of it. Are you ready? It's a good question. And it applies to so many things in life. So often we find ourselves unprepared, not ready, And I want this morning to say, I think there's a difference between being prepared and being ready. And again, I don't want to split hairs about the the words or try and be clever. But being prepared means having everything in order to begin. Being ready, I think, in this context, means being willing. 
being open to the fact of something beginning, something happening, which isn't always the same as being prepared. Being open, being willing, is not necessarily feeling like you are prepared. It's, it's an inner condition that is not about organization or about uh, even confidence in the fact that we've done our homework well. It is about being ready to say yes. John's confession comes in an interesting way. He's asked, who are you? And he says, in the words of the author, these are the things I'm not. Because they ask him, are you the Messiah? No. Are you the prophet? No. Are you Elijah? No. Well, then who are you? Who are you? He quotes from Isaiah. And he, he, he talks about himself, perhaps, as the one who is preparing the way of the Lord. He quotes a passage that Jesus reads from when he's given the scroll. Early on in his ministry, he goes to the temple. He's given the scroll of Isaiah to read. And he opens it at this place and starts at the top of that passage. And I'll read more of it later as I finish. It's powerful stuff. John proclaims himself one who helps people to be ready for the coming of Jesus. There is, there is quite a fine dance as we think about John the Baptist. Because perhaps one of the things happening for him is that he, uh, he's not feeling wildly confident. He's ready to be in the wilderness saying and doing these things. But that doesn't mean they're comfortable or easy for him. That doesn't mean that. And it's one of the great hallmarks, I think, of faith. Faith in ourselves, faith in other people, faith in God. Is that faith means being ready to step into the unknown and the more before we think we've prepared ourselves well enough for it. And we have everything we need. Faith requires, well, faith and confidence in the possibility of being who we think we might be in the moment we're about to step into. Somewhere John is sitting between, between a, 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 a lack of confidence, perhaps, or a growing, growing into the confidence that is his to proclaim what he is there to proclaim. But also somehow finding that healthy place that is so important for all of us, that place where humility and self-confidence come together so that because of what we do know to be true about ourselves and God and our belovedness um, we're able to take ourselves a lot less seriously and not expect or need quite so much to be adored to be adulated to be noticed even in little ways John is clear that he is not the Messiah and that clarity about about who he isn't helps him to be who he is and so i want to offer you that as one of my thoughts this morning that journey for all of us into the place where where self-confidence and confidence in our belovedness in god creates in us or makes room in us for a, a beautiful humility that means that we're open to people in the midst of whatever moment we're in we take less offense we you know, we, we less, we're more easygoing, we, uh, we're more adaptable, we're more inclusive, we're more open to all of life, even if it isn't our life or we don't know it. We, we, don't, uh, we don't get upset when things aren't the way we think they should be, inside or outside the church, in the music we play, the hymns we sing, the order of service, the way we go about things. They, they, they are not the central things and we know it. And we know it. And even when we have strong opinion, we know that it is our opinion and it is our feeling. And therefore others who may be in a different place are not wrong necessarily, just standing in a different place. And maybe we can find a place in the middle or step into each other's shoes for a while. All of those things become possible. The deepest expressions of what it means to be bound to one another in love become possible when we find that healthy balance of self-confidence that breeds humility. Of course, when Jesus is asked, or oh, Jesus talks about, uh, in Matthew's Gospel, Jesus talks about John the Baptist, and people say to him, ask him questions about John. John's disciples come to him and saying, uh, are you the Messiah? After they've gone, he addresses the Pharisees and some others who are there and says, well, you know, when you, go, when you went out into the desert what, to see John, what were you expecting? And the first thing he says is, a reed shaking in the wind. Now, we don't know what to do with that. Because it might be that he's saying, did you go looking for the, the weirdo sideshow? 
You know, the vulnerable person putting it out there, trying to be special. Maybe he 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 speaks a little to to people's curiosity when 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 others clearly step out of what's comfortable for themselves and make themselves vulnerable in some way. And that for some of us that is a bit of a spectator sport. And for others, deeply curious because there is an enormous amount of courage in that and a beautiful willingness to trust God, trust ourselves even. We can't really say. What we can say is that the passage that Jesus refers to in Isaiah is a very powerful passage. It's a very powerful passage. When he's offered the scroll and he picks up the scroll to read it, he reads these words, and I want to read them for you now. Sorry, I'm just going to find them. Oh, there they are. He reads, these, he reads these words from Isaiah. He starts, Jesus, in the temple with these, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me. He has sent me to proclaim good news to the oppressed, to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and release to the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. It's a powerful passage. It's got very little to do with religious behavior or activity uh, in the way we understand it mostly. It's got almost nothing to do with what happens in the temple, except that there is great injustice in the temple. He talks about God coming to provide a, to be with those uh, who mourn in Zion, give them a garland instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, the mantle of praise instead of a faint, faint spirit. And then he says of those to whom God is offering this liberation. They shall build up the ancient ruins. They shall raise up the former devastations. They shall repair the ruined cities, the devastations of many generations. For I, the Lord, love justice. I hate robbery and wrongdoing, and their offspring, I, I will faithfully give them their recompense, and I will make an everlasting covenant with them. Their descendants shall be known among the nations, and their offspring among the peoples. All who see them shall acknowledge that they are a people whom the Lord has blessed. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My whole being shall exult in my God, for he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness, as a bridegroom decks himself with a garland, and as a bride adorns herself with jewels. We like that bit. We like that verse 10, because it speaks about God saving us and, and making us beautiful. But you notice what the work is that gets us to that place. And I say that carefully, because I'm not saying we earn our salvation in any way. We earn our belovedness. We are just loved. But the way that we take part in all that God is doing, the way that Jesus wants us to know we are to take part in all that God is doing when he is given the scroll and he opens it in the temple and reads, is very much found in those middle verses where together we build up the ruins. Together we raise up the devastations. Together we repair the ruins, the ruined cities, the devastation of many generations. Together we love justice. We confront robbery and wrongdoing. We faithfully give people what they deserve. We make everlasting covenants with God and each other as part of God's family. We take part in the rebuilding of our world. You see, Jesus and John together are not saying <laughs> that the Messiah has come to proclaim some, some unique individual salvation moment where our, save, our souls are saved into heaven. They come to invite us into a radically just reimagining of God's kingdom in the world. And Jesus uses those words, and John uses those words, and in Isaiah 61, as Israel, in the writing of Isaiah, as they, as they look forward imminently to their return to their promised land, this is what God asks of them. God says to them, this is who you are to be. This is how you are to behave. This is what you are to do. And we read, of course, how they struggle to understand that and make things religious again and about purity when they really are about justice, kindness, love, generosity, faithfulness, responsibility, stewardship. So bless you this Advent Sunday, Advent Sunday 3, whatever today will be like, whatever your hopes and expectations are of Christmas with whatever joy or dread or anything in between you anticipate that day which is not far off now i pray that you will have as much peace as possible as much love in your heart and your life and the end of your phone in a human face in real memories even as possible and that together we are committed 
as we think about all that might happen between this Christmas and next. Together we are committed to shaping a world that is much fairer and much kinder, much more just, much more where there's much more to celebrate. Where the grabbing after things and the creating of the perfect moments where there is too much of everything anyway for those of us who have the money and watch the adverts. Where that continues to be shaped like our TV adverts for Christmas have been a little bit this year more than before. Shaped into a celebration of people, of incompleteness, of lack of preparation, of all the things that make us human in the best and worst ways that we together offer to God as the light of the world. So bless you. I hope you have a good day. See you next Sunday.